Uh, man, it is good to see you today. Uh, like I said briefly earlier, uh, we spent a big chunk of yesterday in the emergency room because if you have multiple boys, you're going to be there multiple times. And so uh, uh, Isaac was, was in, he had a concussion. He's doing great now. Thank you for all the, the prayers and, and all the, the people that text and, and message, that sort of thing. It's a blessing to have such a wonderful church family. Uh, okay, so uh, the entire Bible showcases that God uses people with high levels of dysfunction to do incredible things. Now, that's not you, is it? Like, you don't have any levels of dysfunction, right? Like, your, your life is a well-oiled machine, right? Like, mm, maybe not so much. Right? We all have little levels of dysfunction, things we do, things we say, uh, ways in which we lead our life that, that maybe we even know we're not supposed to, we just do anyway. All right? And so maybe it makes us feel like, well, God can't use someone like me. But when we open up our Bible, we see time and time again that God has like, specialized in using people with high dysfunction to fulfill his perfect will. Just think of the people that we've talked about in this series so far. We've talked about Adam, right? The, the sin of Adam. Uh, we've talked about the, the sin of Noah. Remember the weird story where there was like nakedness and drunkenness, right? We don't, we don't color that little picture. We don't talk about that with our kids, but, but it's there, right? We, we see the, uh, the, the, the fact that Abraham didn't trust God, right? He didn't trust God. We see that Isaac was a terrible father, right? A terrible father. Uh, last week we saw how Jacob, a terrible, terrible brother, right? Dysfunction at every level, right? Everybody you read about in the Bible, there's going to be uh, dysfunction except for one individual, right? Jesus Christ, right? Dysfunction everywhere. And so uh, if you've been here, you know we're studying the book of Genesis. Everybody say Genesis. Genesis. All right, the very first book in your Bible, we've been going through this and kind of just going generation by generation to see how God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect will and see how that applies to our life. And now we get to the generation that's a little different than what we've been talking about. All right, we've been talking about kind of one person at a time, uh, and now we get to the generation that is considered the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Now, maybe you've, you've read in your Bible at some point, and, and you've read the word tribes, or you've read, bless you, that was strong. Uh, they don't mess around over there. So uh, uh, you, you, you hear the, these different tribes mentioned, and maybe you do one of two things. Maybe you just blow right past it, or maybe you're like, well, I don't really want to take the time to know what in the world that's talking about. Um, and and so, so we don't really pay attention to this tribe thing. But as you read your Bible, when you see the word tribes or tribes of Manasseh or tribe of Ephraim or tribe of, of whatever, these are simply the 12 sons of Jacob, okay? 12 sons of Jacob. Turn to the person next to you and say, 12 sons of Jacob. Okay, so this matters. This is where we're going today. So, so 12 sons of Jacob. So now we're, we're in the generation where there's actually 12 key people, right? And this, this generation has incredible dysfunction as well. Right? In fact, like, like it's, it's kind of nuts, some of the dysfunction. We're going to talk about this week and next week. But evil things. A couple of the brothers uh, murder several people in vengeance, in, rev excuse me, in revenge, just murder people. Um, we're really going to talk about it a, a lot next week. We'll hit on it this week. But 11 of the brothers, um, they sell one of the other brothers into slavery. Right? High levels of dysfunction. You probably haven't done that. Right? <laughs> And today we get to a, a certain story that, that we don't really pay attention to much. Uh, in fact, like you could go to church a long time and not really hear a lot about the story of Judah. All right, I want you to grab your Bibles and I want you to turn to Matthew, or not Matthew, Genesis. This isn't Matthew. Uh, Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. As you turn to Genesis chapter 38, you're going to begin to see, it really starts a little bit before 38, uh, but really the bulk is in 38. We're going to dive into this story of, of a guy named Judah that maybe you don't know a whole lot about. Maybe you've heard the term, uh, but we're going to see something. In this one chapter, there's tons of things that we can learn from. In fact, in this one story of, of Judah, we get to see the, the really some phases of the human experience what it means to be human, particularly what it means to be a human that points their life to Jesus Christ. All right, we're going to see this, okay? So let's dive right in, and we're going to see um, four distinct phases. And every single person here, you're going to find yourself in one of these four phases. You're going to find yourself in, in whatever phase of life, whatever season of life you're in, you're going to find yourself in one of these four, okay? The first one is potential. Everybody say potential. Potential, all right? 
This is an important phase right here. Now, Judah's story begins a little bit before uh, chapter 38. Uh, and Judah's story begins like everybody else's story, right? He was born, uh, his mother was, was overexcited, right? But, but what's really cool is you see that, that Judah's name literally means to praise. Everybody say praise. praise. It means to praise. She was full of praise with the birth of this son. Even if just for a moment, even if just for a small moment, Judah had tons of potential. Or like every baby ever born, tons of potential, like, like limitless possibilities of what, what might happen through the life of this person, right? And so we see this, this potential right off the get-go. And I wonder today um, if you ever think about your potential. As we think about this phase of potential, maybe you're, you're in this season, in this phase of potential, do you ever think about your potential? I don't care how old you are. <laughs> And I don't care if you're in middle school or if you're in middle school, you know, six, seven decades ago. It doesn't really matter. Do you ever think about your potential? Now, what we tend to think about is our potential maybe in our jobs, right, in our careers. Uh, maybe we think about the potential of, uh, of, our, of our family, that sort of thing. But, but what about the potential that you have no matter your age, the potential you have to do incredible things for the cause of Christ, the potential that you have to further and expand the kingdom of heaven. Not the person next to you, but you. Overwhelming potential. There's this really cool verse. It's in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10. It says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for, uh, in advance for us to do. What if I told you that in this room, there was overwhelming potential? What if in this room, there's, there's future church planters? future missionaries, future, future small group leaders, future pastors? What if in this group, right? Like, like right here, those of you watching online, the, the potential in this group, what, what if I told you that there's potential in this room to be culture shifters, disciple makers? What if I said you had the potential to change the spiritual climate at your workplace? You have the potential. Right? What if I said that, that, that you have the potential to cho totally change the culture within your home? To go from a, a culture of, of friction and of frustration to a culture of, of love. That we have the potential. See, there's overwhelming potential in this group to do amazing things for the cause of Christ. And maybe some of us are here. Like, like maybe we feel like God has laid something on our heart. There is something we're supposed to be doing. Is, is there somebody we're supposed to be talking to? There's somebody we're supposed to be sharing the gospel with, right? We have unbelievable potential, but things get in the way, right? Life gets in the way because you're busy. I'm busy. You're dysfunctional. I'm dysfunctional, right? Like, like things can get in the way. And so we, we have this season of, dis, of, 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 uh, of potential, but, but sometimes life gets in the way. And maybe it's small decisions. Maybe it's little small things we've done that have kind of caused us to, to think, man, we once had potential to do amazing things for God, but that ship sailed. Maybe it was a big thing. Maybe you did something big, and it was bad, and it seemed like it train wrecked everything. Well, maybe it did, but it doesn't mean you don't have potential to do incredible things for the gospel, to impact one life, to, to pour and invest and disciple one individual. Like, we all have that potential. Everybody say potential. potential. You have potential. Well, Judah's story was similar he had incredible potential, but, but sin started to, to get in the way. Decisions started to get in the way. We're really going to hit on it next week, but you see this, this story that, that Judah is one of the brothers that, that sells his brother, Joseph, into slavery. Right? Like, that's, that's crazy. But, but the, the story actually is a little, little deeper, a little, little harder on Judah. There's a little more there than, than what really happened. See, the, the plan was to kill Joseph. All right? They were going to kill him. Uh, they were very jealous of him. We'll talk about that next week. But then one of the brothers has this idea like, well, let's not kill him. I mean, he is our brother. And so let's just throw him in a hole. And so threw him in a hole, threw him in a big pit. Well, Judah sees a, a, an opportunity here, right? Well, why would we just throw him in a pit when we could make some money off of this? Or he sees some, some Ishmaelite traders, right? Some traders coming down the road. And he's like, wait a second. This is a great circumstance right here. Great situation. We sell the brother we can't stand and we get some money, right? Because we all like some money. And so that's what they do. 
Right? We see this in, uh, if you flip back over one, Genesis 37, 26. It says, Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conce- uh, conceal his blood? Like, we're not going to make any money off of this. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let, our, let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother. Oh, he's really nice, right? He's our brother, all right? Our own flesh. And his brothers listen to him. All right? His brothers listen to him. It's another sign of potential. This man had influence. Right? This man had, had, had people listening to him. Who are you influencing today? As you look in your leadership, as you look in your life, who's behind you? And are you leading them in the right direction? Are you leading them towards uh, God? Are you leading them towards Jesus Christ? This guy had incredible potential, but he chose it to, to use his influence, to use his authority to sell his brother into slavery. So we're, we're not starting off very good. And what happens is is this, this season begins to change, all right? This, this phase begins to change, this incredible potential. The guy had tons of potential, right, to be used by God in an incredible way. But then he began to enter another phase, another season, and I, I wonder if you're in this season today. The second one is disobedience and destruction. Oh, this is a troubling place to be right here. This is a, this is a difficult place to be. This is the phase where, where sin begins to grow, Right? Have you ever found yourself in your life doing things that you swore you would never do? Like, I would never do that. But then you find yourself doing that? Well, it's not because you automatically became a terrible human being. It's because you've allowed this culture of sin to be okay. This, this culture where, where sin is, is okay, and so it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And now we're involving ourselves in things that, that at one point we told ourselves we'd never do that. But yet now, not only are we doing it, we're justifying it. And it's not a big deal to us. This is where Judah found himself. A troubling scene. Okay, so in this one chapter, right, in this one chapter, you see situation after situation where Judah is just making terrible decisions, doing things that that are not honoring to God whatsoever. All right, first verse we see, uh, it it talks about in in, uh, Genesis 38, 1 and 2. and, and, And this is all about how how Judah married a Canaanite woman. Married a Canaanite woman. And you're thinking like, well, that doesn't really seem like that big of a deal, right? Like, doesn't really move the dial on some major sin, it feels like. Except there's a lot going on here. This is actually a really big deal. Okay, because just, just a, a few chapters earlier, God commands the, the family of Abraham, which Judah is a part of, to not intermarry with the Canaanites. Right? Because there's reasons. All right, the, the reasons being they are deeply pagan. They're idolatrous. They are, they are not God-fearing individuals. They, they, they lead a life completely opposed to God. And so the command is don't marry the Canaanite women. Don't intermarry with the Canaanites. But we're one verse in to, to 38, and there goes Judah. He knows this. He knows what he's not, not supposed to do, but he does it anyway. We can't relate to that at all, can we? Like those things we know we're not supposed to do, but we find ourselves doing in any way. Now, we're really good at pointing those out in other people. Like, you know you're not supposed to do that. Don't do that, right? But we tend to do the same thing. Well, this is Judah, right? He, he's doing the same exact thing. He's growing in opposition to God. I want you to see, what we're going to see is like this, this downward spiral where sin becomes overwhelming and all-consuming in his life. Right? So, so we see this, this reality that he, he married a Canaanite woman. Right? The second thing the second thing we see as we fast forward just a few verses is that he, he uh, raised his kids in a godless home. Okay? He raised his kids in a godless home. Eventually, his wife gets pregnant and has three boys. Everybody hold up to number three. This is going to matter. He's got three boys. Okay, Three boys. And what we see is that, that it almost, if just for a second, it feels like Judah is getting away with his sinful lifestyle. He's got three boys. Right? Joseph, he's out of sight, out of mind. Like, is, we're not really paying attention to that anymore. Doesn't seem like anybody is really bothering him now that he's in the land of Canaan, married this other person. Right? Seems like he's getting away with it. Sometimes it can feel like we're getting away with sin. But we're not. Right? Sin always catches up to us. In fact, in fact uh, uh, Moses talked about this just uh, a few generations later. He says, be sure your sins will find you out. Your sins will find you out. That is a tough pill to swallow right there. We like to navigate in the secret, in the darkness, right? But, 
But Scripture says over and over our sin is going to find us out. And for Judah, this was going to involve those three boys. Right? The consequence of this wicked lifestyle that he's, he's fostering, godlessness, like, like sin is not a big deal. It's going to have consequences because sin always has consequences. So what we see is him uh, bringing up his, his boys in a godless home. All right, if you fast forward, you go to Deuteronomy 6, and you see this picture that, that for each person here, as, as you have children, as you have grandchildren, the, the command on our life is to talk about the ways of God, to remind our children over and over and over. You're going to get an eye roll. You're going to get an, oh, dad, like, like who cares? Right? Over and over again, you're going to remind your children the goodness and the greatness of God. But, but Judah, he's not even doing that at all. Right? He's not even worrying about that in the least bit. And it begins to catch up with him. Verse 6 says this. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn. I don't know what your name is. His name's Ur, okay? E-R. And her name was Tamar. Everybody say Tamar. Tamar. This name matters, all right? You can forget the name Ur here in a second. The, the name Tamar matters, okay? Uh, and he, her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. Now, we don't know the details of this. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know what happened. All we know is that Ur's wickedness resulted in his death. It resulted in his death. That, that the, the culture that Judah had fostered went down another generation. Right? The dysfunction kept going, generation after generation after generation. And now we see that Ur is, is now dead because of his wickedness. And so the story keeps going. Then Judah said to Onan, everybody say Onan. You're learning a bunch of names that you probably uh, never considered naming your children, right? Ur and Onan. He says this, lie with your brother's wife, this gets weird, and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to produce offspring for your brother. Now, if, that's probably not a verse you're going to put on your wall, right? That's kind of weird. What in the world is going on there? Um, but there's actually some great significance right here. This was culturally uh, a norm, right? And, and this was done to, to bring honor to the, to the older son that had, had passed away. So the kids that would be born, the kids that Onan would have with Tamar would be considered, considered Ur's sons and Ur's heirs, okay? So it was, it was a form of, of cultural uh, reverence and respect and honor, okay? But Onan, oh, he was raised in that same house, right? He was raised in that same house where wickedness was normal, and I kind of do whatever I want. And so this culture of sin was prevalent. And so Onan decided just to use Tamar and not have kids with her. And so there's, there's consequence here. He said, uh, uh, verse 10, what he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So he put him to death also. So now Judah has two sons. They're, or he has two. Two of the three are, are, are now dead. Two of the three are dead because of their wickedness. Sin always has destruction. Judah fostered this godless home. Everybody say godless home. A godless home is a dangerous home. Fostered this godless home and the wickedness was so prevalent, the culture was, was so toxic that it just kept going generation after generation after generation. Sin ruins families. It hurts others. It destroys integrity. It breaks up marriages, destroys careers, and causes pain for generations. And now Judah's sins had found him out. They caught up to him. We cannot hide our sin. It will always find us out. Eventually, the sin keeps going. Okay, now we, we begin to read that, that Judah sends away Tamar. Okay, are we, are we tracking here? He sends away Tamar. This is a big problem, right? We, we read that and we're like, okay, he sends away Tamar. But, but no, he had a third son. Right? His name was Shalah. Everybody say Shalah. His name was Shalah. Like the honorable thing, the culturally relevant thing to do, the, the respectful thing to do would be to continue carrying on Ur's uh, lineage through Shalah. But no, he sends off, ships off Tamar, get out of my life, get out of here. He's, he's really operating in this moments of despair. Because think about it. He's lost two of his boys. He's grieving deeply. He's, he's operating in this lifestyle of sin. And so destruction and sin is just, just rampant in his life. And he's in a very dark place. A very, very dark place. It can form this cycle. So grief can lead to sin. And sin can lead to grief. And then grief leads to sin. This vicious cycle. Loneliness can lead to sin. Sin can lead to loneliness. 
and that loneliness leads to sin. It's a, it's a terrible cycle. The effect of, of some outside circumstance can lead us to sin, and now we can, can carry on destruction in, in a number of ways. And this is where we find Judah. Eventually, Judah follows this path to what seems like rock bottom. Okay, this is a, a very well-to-do guy. Okay, he comes from a prominent family. Um, he knows the ways of God, but eventually his life train wrecks until now the only thing that, that seems like a good idea is to sleep with a prostitute. Right? Like, like just, just visualize the, the culture of sin that is just growing, doing things that he knows not to do. And it looks like he hits rock bottom, except there's some really strange circumstances going on around this prostitute. This prostitute that he sleeps with is not a prostitute. It's Tamar. Everybody say Tamar. The daughter-in-law. Not weird at all, right? She goes in and she, she uh, disguises herself. She disguises herself and, and he thinks she, she is a, a shrine prostitute. Verse 15 says this. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute. For she had covered her face, not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law. He went over to her uh, on the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. Real solid guy right here. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. Your seal. Everybody hold up one finger. Your seal. Everybody say seal. Your seal. It's cords. Say cords. And staff. Say staff. Those three things matter. Pay attention to those. Your seal and its cords and the staff in your hand. She answered. So he gave them and he slept with her. And she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on the widow's clothes again. See, Judah wanted a cheap fix, instant gratification. Life was tough right now. He'd lost two children. He was grieving. He was hurting. But he was just operating in this sin of just, just despair, just this, this cycle of, of sin and despair and destruction over and over again. He's in a very, very dark place. He sleeps with a woman, not realizing that it's actually his daughter-in-law. Well, something happens here. Tamar stole those three things. She took them. And now the dude's in a pickle because things were stolen from him, but he can't tell people because that would indicate what he had done. Oh, sin can get us in some precarious situations, can it? Like having to cover our tracks, having to, to lie and having to share secrets so we don't get caught. So we lie about the lie and we lie about that lie. And we just, just kind of get in this very, very difficult situation. It's hard to remember which one was the truth and which one was the lie. And who did I tell this to? All right, and this is the situation he's in. He can't even tell people that, that she'd stolen from him because it would indict him. And people would be uh, very disappointed, to say the least, in what he had done. Okay, so this is the, this is the culture that Judah's in. Not a lot good has been said about Judah so far in this sermon, right? But this is his life. And maybe you've been in that season before. Maybe you're in that season right now. There's not a lot good to say. It's one thing after another after another. No one here knows about it. Complete secret. It's one thing after another after another. And this is, this is Judah. A few months go by. It gets worse, right? A few months go by and he finds out that Tamar is pregnant. He finds out Tamar is pregnant. Well, he has no idea that he, he, still at this point, he has no idea that he slept with Tamar. So she's pregnant. You know what his response was? Kill her. Don't just kill her. Burn her to death. Burn the pregnant lady to death that was my daughter-in-law. Man, this guy's really, really gone down this spiral. Doing things that are just deeply, deeply wicked. Think about his, his track record at this point. Okay, he sold his brother into slavery. He married a Canaanite woman, not supposed to do that. He raised his child in a completely godless home. Right? He shipped, shipped off Tamar, right? just, just one thing after another after another. Then he slept with a prostitute, and now he wants to kill some pregnant lady. Deep wickedness in his life. Deep, deep wickedness. Darkness was consuming. And my guess is that we don't struggle with any of these particular sins. Maybe we do, I don't know, but... but, but my guess is there's a, a fair chunk of people that that's not really relatable. And maybe it's not. But the atmosphere of sin, the normalization of sin, the progression of sin, oh, we can relate to that. We can relate to leading lives of deep lust, of deep pride, of deep jealousy, of hurting other people, expressing and, and acting out in our anger. Oh, we're good at that. 
We can crave money more than anything else. We can crave fame and fortune. Like, like we're really good at all those things. And so, no, maybe you don't relate to any specific sin, but we can relate to a culture of sin that we fostered in our own life. And maybe that's where you're at today. But we see something with this second phase of disobedience and destruction. When we're in this phase, we're often faced with a situation and experience that causes us to assess. Now, how we respond to that's on us, but causes us to look at the situation and make a proper decision as we, we kind of assess our life, we assess our struggles, we assess what we're doing. And as we assess that, we make a decision. Well, he has the same thing. And it leads us to the third uh, phase that we see, confession. Everybody say confession. 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 So before uh, I, I got married, we were, Valerie and I were engaged. And uh, believe it or not, I was a, uh, an individual who resurfaced bathtubs and countertops in uh, Oklahoma City metro area apartment complexes. All right? And I know you're thinking, like, I didn't know he could do stuff. Uh, I can't. I was terrible at this job. <laughs> Right? That's why I'm a pastor. I can't do anything else, right? Um, this job was terrible. I mean, if you do that for a living, God bless you, and you're probably awesome at it. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. I was terrible at it. And so I'm doing this job, and, and, and I'm just not doing it well. Um, there was one day, that, so, so we would come through, and we had these basically big, fancy uh, paint guns, and we would come and spray epoxy onto countertops and, and bathtubs, that sort of thing. So there was a day where I'm, I'm fixing this guy's bathtub, and so if there was like a crack in the bathtub, it was my job to come fix it and make it look like that crack was never there, okay? So that's what I was supposed to do. I didn't do that at all. It was terrible. Uh, but that's what I was supposed to do, and so I was doing my job, doing what I was uh, trained to do, but I didn't realize there was a, a big vent we would put, because this put off tons of dust and it smelled like paint, right? A very strong odor. We would put a vent in the bathroom and then just snake this thing out the front door, okay? Well, there was one day that I didn't realize that my, my vent had a giant hole in it. <clears throat> giant hole. This is very bad, okay? Very, very bad. So, so at the end of it, it turns out uh, the guy's apartment is covered in epoxy, covered. And of course, he had a giant flat screen TV. You know, the ones from about 16 years ago, they were like, like this big and weighed like four ton. He had one of those fancy things, right? And, and, and he, was, he was a very well-to-do guy, you could tell, bachelor that had nice stuff. And, and so for days, I'm just like wiping off the TV. It's just terrible, right? I did not like this job. Oh, I did not like this job at all. And eventually it came to a moment where I had to make a decision, Okay. Uh, the, the, there, there was a day, a few weeks or months later, I don't know, um, where I'm at the back of my, my Isuzu Rodeo. Oh, I love this car. It was awesome. Oh, I love the Isuzu Rodeo. The back of the Isuzu Rodeo, and, and I'm mixing all these chemicals. So in the back of the car, you have all these chemicals, which means my car smelled like lacquer thinner. Okay, so if you rode with me, it was like, like you roll down the windows like, whoa, dude. And I'm just like, what's up? You know? Uh, anyway, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> And so, so like, like in the back of this car, right, and, and so I'm mixing all these chemicals. And then is what I had to do. I had to shake it up. I had to shake up these, these chemicals, and then I could go and do my job. Well, this one day, I, I'm mixing all these chemicals, doing all that I'm, I've been trained to do, and I, I connect the, the thing to the gun, right, and, and then I start to shake it, and I've done something wrong at some point because I'm shaking it, and it comes, it comes off over my amazing Isuzu rodeo, right? And, and just all over the back, all over the back, interior, exterior, and this is very quick drying stuff, very quick drying. And so I go into panic mode, right? And I'm trying to wipe everything down, and, and, and I don't, I don't, like, if, if you find an Isuzu rodeo with a white paint spot on the back of it, that's my old car, right? Because uh, it's probably still there to this day. Um, but it was at that moment, ooh, I had a moment, uh, I'm assessing this situation. <laughs> I am not good at this job. I hate this job. I have to do something else. Now, I wouldn't recommend um, like being engaged and quitting a job with no prospects, uh, but that's what I did. Okay? I, I quit a job, ended up getting a little uh, job at a bank to, to, uh, to, to get me to where I eventually worked at the church here, but it was that moment that I recognized. I assessed my situation like, oh, I can't continue this. I'm terrible at this. Like, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Well, Judah has a moment like this, this moment of recognition. Everybody say recognition. recognition. Judah has a moment like this 
but he might be able to see it coming. Right? Verse 20, uh, 25 says this. Here's Tamar. Remember, she's, she's now pleading for her life. Judah, Judah now wants her burned to death. But verse 25, as she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these. Laid these things out. She added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Well, do you recognize? Like, of course he recognized. They're his. Right? He has this incredible moment where it's like, oh my goodness. Like he's, he's, he's found out. His sin has now found him out. It has caught up to him. There's no denying. Those are his. And this moment is a moment of, of recognition. The, the, when it says that, that he recognized something, uh, it's, it's a, a, a distinct word called nakar. Everybody say nakar. Nakar. Verse 26 says this. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shalah. So he's in this moment of confession. Not only has he been found out, he's confessing sin from back in the day. In this moment of confession. See, this Nakar moment, Nakar means to, to, to see the situation, to perceive the, the reality, and make a decision based upon that. And he had this moment. He's looking out, he's seeing that he's busted, and he's making a decision based upon this. His Nakar moment is a moment that led to confession. And so maybe today we're in this season of, of disobedience and destruction. We're, we're weaving this terrible story. It's one sin after another. But, but God has blessed us with a moment, a Nakar moment to assess, to look out, and to see where we're at in life. Or maybe some of you, like you, you've had that moment. Maybe you were once leading a life far from Jesus, but you had this Nakar moment where you could recognize, and it's like your eyes were finally opened to the destructive path you had been leading, and now he gets to lead us to a point of confession. Uh, John chapter 1, uh, 1 John 1 verse, uh, verse 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9 is a popular verse. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. I wonder today, church, what an Akar moment might look like for you as you assess, as you look out, as you see what, what, what your life is drifting towards. What's the culture in your own life? Where have you tolerated sin? And it used to be this, but now it's this, and it's probably going to be this soon. Like, like assess our own life. And maybe you don't struggle with the distinct sins that Judah struggled with, but make no mistake, we have specific struggles. And maybe today is that opportunity of confession. The car moments, these recognition moments allow us to change the course of our life. And when we do this, when we respond to these moments where, where God is like trying to wake us up and, and trying to draw things to our mind of, of, of ways in which we can lead a life more, more towards him, something happens. It unlocks that potential. That potential we have is now unlocked because it leads us into the fourth phase, the final phase that I want to talk about, blessing. Remember, Judah's name meant praise. Right? His name, like, he had tons of potential. Well, as you continue reading the story, you see this Nakar moment was deeply impactful. All of a sudden, now the Judah you see in Scripture is not defined by sinfulness. Right? You, don't really, you, don't, you don't see that a whole lot. Now, his life and his legacy began to point towards bringing praise and honor and glory to God. He, he has situations where he writes the wrongs with his brother years later, right? And, and his life begins to point this, this way, towards bringing praise and honor to God. Because Tamar, remember Tamar? Everybody say Tamar. That girl's been through a lot, right? Whew, she's, she's got a story to tell. Well, Tamar is now pregnant with Judah's kids. She has twins. The oldest one is named Perez. Everybody say Perez. I know it's a lot of names. But these are actually important names. Perez has a son. That son has a son. Generations pass. Generations pass. Eventually you get to David. Right? King David. Judah's life led to the greatest king in Israel. Well, if you know any about geology, you know that, that generations passed after David. Generations keep going, keep going, keep going. And eventually you get to Jesus Christ. Revelation uh, in Revelation, I think it's Revelation 5, it, it talks about that Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. Ah, oh, like that's one of his names. Judah was a terrible person. 
Judah did a ton of things. Like, like those are just the things that made the one chapter. Like, he's got a whole other life that didn't make it in that one chapter. But Jesus, one of his names that we'll, we will proclaim at the end of days, he's the lion from the tribe of Judah. Judah, Judah allowed that, that Nakar moment to totally shift who he was and what his heritage would be. His first story, tragedy, pain, destruction, set up a culture to, to ruin the, the lives of his children. The second story, very different. He'd been given a second chance. And now these boys were going to eventually point to Jesus Christ. He's in a moment of blessing. See, a moment of blessing is not a moment where, where uh, you don't have any problems. Judah still had a very, very difficult life. He was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But if we're in this, this season, this phase, this, this part of our life where we're, we're defined by blessing, it doesn't mean we have a bunch of stuff. You can live in a hut and be in this phase right here. But when we're in the season of blessing, it's, it's almost like, like we're operating at another level. Pain and tragedy is still there, but we have incredible trust and faithfulness in God. We know He's good. We know He loves us. And so we're going to invest, we're going to pour our life into Him. Our life is not going to be easy. We're going to have struggles. But we're not going to consume our life with sin. We're going to address those situations, confess that sin, and we're going to begin to live life that, that even though circumstances happen, we're focused in on our Creator. We're focused in on the greatness and the goodness of God. All throughout the Bible, God using incredibly dysfunctional people to accomplish his perfect will. Even one of the most dysfunctional people that we could ever describe, eventually his name is a part of one of the names of Jesus. So I don't know what phase you're in. I have no idea. I don't know, maybe some of you are in potential phase. And maybe God is calling you to, to some specific things, like, like, man, I need to be talking to this. I need to, to begin to do this. I need to move in this way. I need to change careers. I need to, to, to really just look at how my life is going and, and really begin to make practical decisions. You're in a season of potential. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're in this season of disobedience and destruction. It's just, it's just snowballing. Destruction in your relationships, your, your job, your career, your integrity, and it's just one thing after another after another. It's a dark place to be. Maybe that's where you find yourself. Or maybe you find yourself at a Nakar moment where we recognize, we look out, we assess, and we see, and we have the opportunity for confession. And we read, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. And that leads us to the season of blessing. What might it look like in your life to be operating in blessing? Doesn't mean you don't have stuff. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean work isn't stressful. Doesn't mean kids aren't busy. But you're operating next level now. And life can be very challenging, but you trust in God. You are dwelling with Him. You have a peace that passes all understanding. I don't know where you're at. But I want you to, to really listen to God this morning as He's prompting you, as He's pressing on you. See, how do we get to this point of blessing? Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. We haven't done uh, anything like this in a long time, but as, uh, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to give you an opportunity to just really have your Nakar moment. Really look out and see, okay, where am I at in this? I want you to, to raise your hand if, if you feel maybe you are, you're in the season of potential. God is drawing things to your mind that, that man, God, God could use me in a mighty way. Right? There, are, there are things going on, I see hands all over the place. Right? Like lots of us in this season of potential, it's like, oh, what could be? Yes, you have potential in your jobs. You can work your way up the corporate ladder. You're so good at what you do. But you have overwhelming potential to be used by God in an unbelievable way to impact people, to disciple people, to change a culture, and to bring people to Jesus. So if that's you and he's drawing something to your mind, talk to somebody about that. What might he be prompting you towards when you think of your potential? Now, let's get a little more vulnerable. I think we can all relate to this. Who here, out of these four stages, like, like we're in this season of disobedience and destruction? Doesn't mean it's something major like what Judah's done. But we have stuff, and we're struggling with it. We're human, right? Like, like we have sin. If that's you, I, want, I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to point you out. 
But if you can relate to that season, raise your hand, I see hands. Oh, that God would just speak to you in this moment. God would speak to you in this, this part of life where it's just one struggle after another struggle and it's just overwhelming. Or maybe we're in that third one and, and we're faced with our reality. Our reality is, is things are not going great. And so I need to make some changes. I need to, to confess some things. If God is calling you to a Nakar moment where you recognize, you assess, and you acknowledge the situation, and you make a decision based upon what you see or perceive, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. If this is one of those moments, I see hands. Praise the Lord. Or maybe you just want to spend a moment praising God. That you've been through it, you've been through the battles. You've been through the valley of the shadow of death. But you know and you appreciate the second part of Psalm 23 where he anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so if, if you just want to celebrate, this isn't a, a point of pride, like no one's going to see you raise your hand, but if you just want to acknowledge that somehow, some way, through God's mercy, you are in this season of blessing and it doesn't make any sense. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Amen. Man, amen. A lot of people raising their hands are going through a lot of stuff. But man, that's a good season to be in. That's a good part of life to be in. We don't understand his goodness. We don't understand his mercy. We don't understand his love, but we declare it. God, we come to you today. Maybe some of us having that Nakar moment, that moment where we assess, we look out, and we, we're forced to make a decision. Go back and keep up this, this destructive, disobedient life. Like, we can do that. We can choose that. We have that freedom. But maybe there's some here today that know something has to be done. The trajectory of our life is not one that we're excited about. So we need to have that moment, and that moment needs to draw us towards confession. So for those that raised their hands, for those that didn't, may we, may we confess our sin and trust that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and purify us from all of our unrighteousness. And may we step in to that season of blessing. Father, I, I, I just praise you for the people that, that were able to raise their hand that they're in a season of blessing. They have financial problems. They have health issues. They have struggles. But they're just so thankful for your mercy and your grace and your goodness. We trust in you, Father. We live our life from overflow of your goodness. God, speak to us. If there's any decision we need to make, any conversation we need to have, maybe we go talk to one of our prayer partners in the back here in a second. But we have one last chance to just praise your name, and that's what we're going to do with our time. Father, we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.